Good evening and thank you for joining me on Black News. Tonight, I'm Mark Lamont Hill. An update tonight concerning the men convicted of killing Ahmad Arbery. Travis and Greg McMichael, along with William Roddy Bryan, will all stand trial on hate crime charges related to Arbery's death. Both McMichaels reversed their plans to plead guilty in the federal case of a U.S. district judge rejected terms of a plea deal. It would have allowed the men to serve 30 years of their sentence in federal prison instead of state custody. In January, all three men were sentenced to life in prison after being convicted of killing Arbery. The McMichaels without parole and Brian with parole. The federal trial is to determine if they also violated Arbery's civil rights during the killing. <laughs> The New York Giants, Miami Dolphins owner Stephen Ross, and Denver Broncos president of football relations John Elway all issued a response to the claims made in the lawsuit filed by former Dolphins head coach Brian Flores. Elway says the allegations that he was hungover during a 2019 head coach interview with Flores are, quote, false and defamatory. Ross is also echoing the same tone. He says claims that he offered to pay $100,000 to Flores for every loss during his first season is false, malicious, and defamatory. Meanwhile, the Giants, in response to Flores's claims that the team interviewed him for its head coaching job only to fulfill its Rooney Rule obligations, say those claims are, you guessed it, disturbing and simply false. The news comes as the NFL prepares for Super Bowl 56. Super Bowl 56 is coming up. People are getting excited. People are getting their plans together, putting together their, their, their wings and their, their drinks and they organizing all the Super Bowl uh, festivities. Everybody wants to do something for the Super Bowl. People are excited, even if they don't like football, because they want to watch the halftime show. They want to see what Jay-Z is going to do. They want to see what Eminem is going to do. They want to see this whole production put together by Rock Nation, because they are excited, like all Americans are, about the Super Bowl. It's the most watched TV event of the year. Don't watch it. It's really that simple. Don't watch the Super Bowl. Everybody thinks that we are somehow past the moment where Colin Kaepernick lost his career for kneeling. We're not. People think that because Jay-Z and his company was brought on to oversee the activities of the Super Bowl and brought over to do community engagement for the NFL, that somehow we're okay. We are not. Some of y'all think that because we have players who are making millions, tens of millions at times, that somehow that makes it acceptable to have inequality or injustice in the NFL. It is not. Brian Flores is the proof that Jay-Z was wrong when he said we're past kneeling now. Now, Jay-Z didn't mean in society. He didn't mean we shouldn't resist in protest. He was saying in the NFL, we got to move forward and advance the ball. But the problem is we can't advance it if we have problems at the ground level. We got coaches who can't get jobs. The league is 70 percent black. That means that seven out of every 10 players who plays professional football is a Negro. And yet there's only one head football coach right now who is black. We got another one who is of color, but we got one who is black. And there's nobody on the horizon. We literally have a better chance of putting a black woman on the Supreme Court right now than we do of getting a black person to be head coach of the NFL, where 70 percent of the people are black. And the league knows it. They have the Rooney Rule, which is a sham. They have these fake interviews, which are ridiculous. They let them be offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators. They let them be trainers. They let them play and risk their lives, get CTEs. And then after you get the CTE, they tell you that they're not going to give you money for the CTE because they're also race norming and saying that black people have less brain power, brain functioning and intelligence than their white counterparts anyway, which is the same logic that leads to the league being run by white men. This is a classic overseer slave relationship they think we're good enough to stand on that line and run into each other like car crashes over and over again they think we're good to run and catch and jump but they don't think we're good enough to think that's why we had to go decades before we could even be quarterbacks because they don't think we have the brain power to make it happen so what are you going to do now don't you can't plead ignorance anymore you know the league is racist you know the head coaching searches are racist ain't no black owners so you know that is both class and race driven but racist. We know it. And we know 
that no matter how many Negroes dance on stage at halftime, it doesn't matter in relation to the bigger point, which is that we are deeply unfree, and the NFL is a reflection of that unfreedom. So if you watch the Super Bowl, you are part of the problem. So I'm calling on all of you out there, and I, and I know you see me. You watch me. Head of the NAACP, head of the Urban League, head of this, head of that. My brothers, my sisters, I'm asking you, join in the boycott. It's starting right here on Black News tonight, but we're going to grow it. Join in the boycott. What does the NFL owe you? What do you owe the NFL? What obligations do you have? The answer is that you don't have any obligations and do what's right. If you don't have any political ties, do what's right. If you don't have any economic ties, do what's right. If there's nothing under the table, do what's right. What's right is to boycott the Super Bowl until we have proper representation, not just on the field, but in the head coaching office and in the owner's suite. That's all I got to say. All right. Now, moving on to another controversy that has been making national headlines. The famous actor, comedian, and TV personality, Whoopi Goldberg. She is reportedly threatening to quit The View over her two-week suspension. To recap what has happened so far, on Monday, when she was discussing a Tennessee school district's decision to ban the Pulitzer Prize-winning graphic novel The Mouse, which is about a Holocaust survivor, she said, and I partly quote, the Holocaust is not about race, it's about man's inhumanity to man. The next day on The View, she immediately apologized for those comments. However, later that day, the ABC President Kimberly Godwin announced Goldberg has been suspended for two weeks effective immediately. And since then, according to the New York Post, Goldberg is livid and is threatening to quit the show, where she has been a co-host since 2007. In light of all of this, the Washington Post's Karen Etia, in her latest opinion column, says we need critical race analysis now more than ever. And she is joining me now on Black News Tonight to tell us why. Karen, so good to see you. Thank you for joining me on Black News tonight. Uh, in your piece, you say Goldberg's misguided rant shows why there is a need for including a race, critical race-based analysis of how we teach not just U.S. history, but world history. Why do you say that? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, Goldberg, you just watch the clip and you can you can see her and her, and her co-host really trying to, to rail her back in. I mean, this is a really complex history that even I had to go to an elite school, college, you even really learn about the history of how in so many ways, like pre-modern anti-Semitism in Europe paved the way for what we think of as uh, modern racism in, in, Western, in the Western world right now. So I think, you know, when, when uh, Whoopi Goldberg was, was talking about it, it's, it's not about race, it's about... It, uh, man's inhumanity to man. There's a long history of how uh, Jewish people were basically the blueprint for being treated as a biologically uh, inferior peoples in Western Europe. And then that logic, that false uh, idea backed by pseudoscience and eugenics, then became a, a logic and a basis for slavery, for colonialism, and for exploitation. And the Holocaust, in many ways, um, was the ultimate evil perfection of the uh, uh, of the, the endpoint of that logic. So for her to say that it was it wasn't about race, uh, modern, Racism has its basis in anti-Semitism, but it also has its basis largely what all this is for or, or about is about white supremacy and about this idea um, that has persisted of this quote unquote master race. Absolutely. And, and I think that's where Goldberg sort of lost her footing. And you're right. This race analysis takes a lot of uh, nuance to understand, right? On the one hand, we're saying, and our Jewish brothers and sisters would say this, that Jews are not a race, right? Um, they're a it's a religion, it's a nation, it's a, na it's a national identity, but race is a very particular thing. But they were absolutely racialized within the context of Nazi Germany. Hitler racialized them and treated them as a race that needed to be eliminated. That's part of the evil of the Holocaust. And it was an awful experience. And, and Whoopi Goldberg is sort of reducing race to 
U.S. black-white paradigms. And she's like, well, they're white and they're white, so they can't be a race. And it's like, no, they absolutely were treated as a race and, and oppressed as a race. Um, but that nuance doesn't really take place on TV that often. And I think you make a really interesting point. You say that ABC could have provided a space to educate Whoopi Goldberg and the rest of the ABC audience. But um, instead, they didn't. Instead, they suspended her and they sort of shut down conversation, no? Yeah, and it was really ironic because the whole premise of the conversation of the segment was about silencing and banning books about the Holocaust, which is in a broader context of what is happening now with banning books about from authors who are uh, racialized, LGBT, anything that basically uh, makes white people uncomfortable and uh, challenges, specifically challenges white Christian supremacy. So it was just really ironic and deeply uh, tragic that in a discussion about, um, frankly, some of these uh, fascist Nazi era tactics of banning books, that they also banned uh, a discussion about whiteness. And again, you can look at her co-hosts and, and you can see that they were like, this is about white supremacy. And, and look, Mark, honestly, this is what is so frustrating and why we're all trapped in this dark matrix that white supremacy has created. Because here we are wondering about who is white, what is race, what is this? And it takes us off of the main target, which is resisting white supremacy and pushing back against um, this idea of the master race, which we are still fighting around the world. Jewish people are still fighting back against. Black people are still fighting back against. And so it was really just a missed opportunity for us to continue this dialogue about how do we fight white supremacy today? That is absolutely true. And a key piece of that, as I alluded to earlier, is thinking about race outside of the context of the U.S. black-white Binary. People are racialized in different ways, in different contexts. How hard is it for us as Americans to think outside of our own narrow, local uh, racial lens? It's really hard. I mean, we just don't learn about it. We don't learn, even, even though, you know, the Holocaust very obviously targeted Jews. And very obviously, you know, we, we see that um, Jews were the primary um, the target of the Holocaust. We don't see in our history books that this was really about eliminating also black uh, Afro-Germans, Africans, um, about Slavs. We don't learn about that history, about the Roma um, as well. Um, almost half their population was eliminated. And so we see this, these images of what we would call white looking people. And it opens up a whole uh, another conversation about what it means to pass as white today, right? Um, and so I think it's, this is why I say that I think um, applying, how applying critical race analysis helps us understand how race and whiteness has been fluid throughout time, how uh, those who are in power of uh, kind of white supremacist regimes around the world have always bent and shaped uh, the boundaries of what it means to be part of their club in order to fit their desires, right? So it's it's really difficult, but you know I think my, for my purposes, I was just hoping to put some of this this history out there and to put some of people who theorize that this is also so very much related to uh, uh, imperialism and and slavery and Absolutely. it's all. It's such a, it's such an opportunity to do this. Um, at least on this show, we have opportunity to unpack some of it, even if ABC didn't. So, Karen, stay with me. We're going to take this conversation uh, a little further when we come back from the break. Everybody stay right here. This is such an important conversation. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Black News Tonight. We continue with our discussion about the importance of a critical race analysis, especially now in light of the current controversy surrounding Whoopi Goldberg's suspension from the popular daytime talk show, The View. Back with me is uh, the Karen Attia. She's an opinion columnist at The Washington Post. Uh, welcome back to the show. Talk to me about um, making this connection between 
uh, Nazi policies and Jim Crow apartheid laws. You started to talk about this uh, prior to uh, the commercial break, and I think it's an important connection to understand so that people see this relationship or the overarching presence of white supremacy, which you talked about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it. the thing that we have to remember about that period of time in world history is that this was a time when rapid industrialization. This was when um, Western powers were competing with one another to gobble up the world's resources, right? And the United States had ended slavery, but obviously had still maintained its uh, regime of, uh, of its own version of, of racial apartheid, basically. So, um, you know, there's been scholarship that the Nazis, Hitler looked at what the U.S. was doing and was like, hmm, we'll take some of that Jim Crow. Um, we'll take some of these same concepts of separation, of segregation, of IDing, of, of basically separating and, and excluding certain groups of people from public life, thereby making it easier to eliminate them, right? And so if we think about even the Jim Crow era and even into Reconstruction, Though black people technically were supposed to be free, you saw these basically pogroms around the United States of, of lynchings and, and mass atrocities against black people, right? And so it's to understand that in, in many ways, yes, obviously the German and the European context was extraordinarily specific, um, even the, the language and the ways um, that it was done uh, was specific, but in many ways they were borrowing each other's practices, even the practice of checking skin tone and hair and, uh, and head shapes and nose shapes. Um, they also were, were borrowing and using the same fake race pseudoscience, right? So um, this is why it's, it's when, when people say it's, it's not about race, it is very much about how race craft works. And race craft is part of the, the segregation, the, the cleansing, the, the pseudoscience, the eugenics um, of displacement and of violence, frankly, and of terror. And this is how, um, and as we've seen in the, the US and scholarship on how the US came to be, Germany, um, other European powers as a scholar, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and, and many others wrote at the time, uh, were based a lot of their power on the subjugation of who they decided were inferior races. Well, now, before the Nazis came to power, German colonial forces also committed genocide in Namibia. Uh, you know, I, I hear at Black News tonight, of course, it's important for us to sort of think throughout the diaspora about the various evils uh, that this regime committed, both in Germany and also more broadly. Those types of conversations don't seem to happen very much. Is, is there a reason, you think, why we're not talking about uh, just, just how broad in scope this, this evil sort of moment was? Because the powers that be <laughs> uh, in Germany and in the U.S. Um, have covered these histories up for a long time. It was only recently, only in the last few years, that Germany even... Uh, owned up to the Herero uh, genocide and the Nama genocide in, uh, in Namibia. And um, it took me actually going to Berlin and, and seeing an exhibit and understanding just the, the scale and the scope of it. They nearly eliminated these groups. And what was so chilling about learning about that is that the tactics that they used on the Herero, they ended up using not too much uh, later on on the Jewish people and all the other groups of people that were targeted in the Holocaust. So sterilization, um, medical experimentation, um, uh, camps, labor camps, forced uh, forced labor, all of those tactics, they tried and they successfully did with a chilling efficiency on the Herero and then did that on uh, the Jewish population um, in Germany. And so I think a lot of it also just has to do with, um, we don't hear about this history. Germany was not made to pay a price <laughs> for what they did to the Herero, right? And so um, it's good now that Germany is finally, slowly coming around to facing up to its horrible past um, in many ways. But it's, 
it's deliberate. Um, there are reasons, similar reasons to why, um, why didn't we hear about the Tulsa race massacre for such a long time? These regimes, in order to keep their power, need us to be ignorant of their crimes so that, well, I mean, long-standing fears, right, of having to, whether it's pay a debt, whether it is losing um, a sense of uh, legitimacy, moral claim, claims to moral superiority. Um, this is why we don't know about these things. We don't know about these things because the cover-ups, the whitewashings, deliberate. And that is why we need to have the more nuanced conversation about race. I'm, I'm grateful that you and I had an opportunity to unpack this. And I get the daytime talk shows aren't going to be able to unpack a conversation about racial formation and white supremacy and colonialism and imperialism in the four or five minutes uh, of the segment. But there has to be an opportunity when a mistake is made, I think, uh, to educate the public so that we don't just get into this kind of reductive analysis or just a dismissal of Whoopi Goldberg and turn her into a, the kind of scapegoat for really what is our collective failure to think about race deeply. Anyway, Karen, I'm grateful that you think about race deeply, that you write about it deeply, and that you weighed in today on our show. Please come back soon so we can continue the conversation. Uh, everybody, make sure you read everything she writes, not just in the Post, but anywhere she is, because Karen Atia is brilliant.